welcome to the Farm Beats podcast. Farm Bits is proudly produced by the Nebraska Digital Agricultural Team and hosted by students at the University of Nebraska. The Farm Bits podcast comes to you each week to discuss the trends, the realities, and the value of digital agriculture. Through interviews with experts, producer, produce, through interviews with experts, producers, and innovators from across the agricultural industry, we hope that you step away from each episode with new practical knowledge of digital agriculture technology. Hello, Farm Bits followers, and welcome to another episode of the Farm Bits podcast. I'm Katie Bathke. And I'm Deepa Gimire, and we are glad to have you with us as we begin our discussion on carbon markets with Joan Sanaha, Senior Science Manager with Agro Carbon Alliance. Sure. Thank, thanks. Uh, so thanks, Deepak, for the opportunity to introduce myself. I'm really p- pleased to join you all here in, in this discussion. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I, I always like to tell folks that I grew up on a farm not very far from Lincoln, just about an hour north and west of here. So that's kind of always grounded me in terms of working for growers. I Everything that I've ever spent my entire career on is around providing solutions to help growers become more profitable and also more sustainable. And the things they do. So a little bit about, uh, in terms of background, I received a BS degree from the University of Nebraska in agronomy here a few years back, and then did my graduate work at Colorado State University, where I in turn stayed for a few years. It was a, a professor there, worked in extension, working with growers, providing them advice around how to, to you know, cropping practices to be more sustainable. Then, then in Returned back to uh, Lincoln and worked with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Agricultural Research Service for a few years. Uh, there I was uh, working on nitrogen management t- topics. And then after that, I, I w- went to took a job with Corteva and I was in the agronomy sciences team. And again, providing support and research and efforts to you know, information to growers around nitrogen management. And most recently now, I've, I've uh, taken a, a, a position with the uh, with Agoro Carbon Alliance, where I'm the head of the science team, um, leading that the effort there around science of, of of soil carbon. That's awesome! Such a such a rich history too. So many so many different areas that you're been involved in. So we're really excited to hear about. And correct me if I'm wrong. We you said you call it Agoro. Agoro Carbon Alliance, the long, Perfect. the long version, but we uh, Agoro is a good way to go too. So okay, yeah. okay, I didn't want to, I didn't want to mispronounce it. But our second question is, can you tell us a bit about Agoro Carbon Alliance and how it started? Right. So Agoro is a startup company of Yara International. They're a, they're an international fertilizer company located over in Oslo, Norway. That's the headquarters. But they have a large global footprint. They're on. I I can't remember the number of employees they have. That they're they're a global company and provides fertilizer solutions, crop protection inputs, and things like that. And they recently they've made a an effort to to be to to talk about regenerative agriculture and how that can improve uh, reduce the carbon footprint for agriculture. And so this we're totally owned by uh, Yar International. They I joined the company back in twenty twenty one, and been with them since basically that's the beginning of the company and but we're a separate company sort of to to, to maintain some independence from a, a you know yara if you will okay hey that's that's good to know yeah i think i have heard quite a lot about yara in the national land i think in our research as well we have used some of their fertilizer products but yeah mm-hmm. glad to know uh about this initiative of agro carbon alliance and we are excited to learn more about that. So can you please uh, tell us what are the different services that are provided by the Agro Carbon Alliance? Right, so cur- right now, currently, we are what we call a carbon project developer. So we're a, a company that's basically vertically integrated in terms of we we work with growers, we incentivize them to in- implement practices such as uh, no- no-till agriculture, um, cover cropping and then in range and pasture, we incentivize ranchers to do ro- increase their rotational grazing pr- practices, add some uh, small amounts of nitrogen fertilizer uh, to, to increase carbon sequestration. And then the other thing is we 
uh, asked them to introduce like leguminous species into native range systems. Again, all these practices have been shown by research. All things that we that we uh, we uh, incentivize growers to do have been shown by research. Research has been done, for example, at the University of Nebraska that actually increase soil carbon. And so that's that's really what we are. So in terms of a project, we we incentivize the growers to do this. We ask them to sign a contract with us for 10 years. And then we measure the carbon that's that accumulates in the soil over the course of those 10 years. And then we we sell that on the on the voluntary carbon markets. And so the idea is that we take that revenue, we obviously collect a small portion of that revenue to pay for soil sampling in some of the activities we do, but we turn return that revenue back to the grower to incentivize them to Im implement these practices. That's awesome. I love that it's um, research-based and that you're showing that you're working with um, growers for a long term, like signing on for 10 years. I feel like that's that's very unique within the industry and I, I really think that's awesome. So can you expand a little bit on what is carbon credit and how it works? This topic might be a little bit newer to our growers, and we're wanting to hear your um, your thoughts on it. Sure. So, I mean, basically carbon credit is uh, a lot of farmers think about carbon in the soil as organic matter. But in this case, we're what we're selling on the voluntary markets is actually the tons of carbon that are sequestered in the, in the, in the soil associated with a regenerative practice. And so organic matter is about basically about half of carbon. And so our the, the role, for example, the science team that I'm the head of is we we uh, develop the methodology. We follow the, one of the standard practices, the methodology practices that I, I'm not sure if our your listeners will have heard of Vera, but they're essentially like an auditing, auditing company, somebody that would go in and audit a bank and make sure everything is, you know, is transparent. And so our goal, we have used their methodology and we use a, pro, a procedure called measure and model. So we measure the soil carbon with soil samples. So for example, a grower signs up with this in year one, we're out there collecting soil data, soil sample data to measure how much carbon is in the soil when they initiate these practices. And then we're back in year five and then year 10. And, and the difference in carbon accumulated over those years is basically the carbon credit. So we're, what we have to do is basically con confirmed with the buyer that this is a legitimate asset, just like a bushel of corn that can be sold on the voluntary markets. So if there's a ton of carbon in that soil that's accumulated over five years or within over the course of 10 years, maybe five or six tons, then that, that's the carbon that can be sold on the bar voluntary markets. We also use in between our soil sampling events, the modeling approaches, we use a model called the Descent Carbon Model. It's a biogeochemical model actually uh, there's folks at the University of Nebraska that have worked on this. It's been it's been developed over the course of about 20 years. The model actually references back to when I was at Colorado State University. It, that's kind of where it originated. Um, again, it's a biogeochemical model that kind of simulates what's going on in the soil. We can use that model to kind of help verify and kind of corroborate what we've seen with the with our soil measurements. So both of them kind of guide each other, if you will. Yeah, really. That sounds uh, really interesting. Thank you for explaining that. Uh, I think that was uh, pretty simple and easy to follow through. Uh, okay, when we are talking about these credits and uh, talking about the partnership with the farmers, uh, how do you think farmers can benefit from these carbon credit service and what would be expected out of them? Right. Good, great question, Deepak. So the way we always like to explain it to growers is the carbon revenue that they will receive from these voluntary markets is perhaps not enough to really pay for all the things that they're going to do. But what we always talk about is when they implement these practices, they see a, a significant improvement in soil health. Carbon essentially does a lot of good things for the soil, it increases water infiltration, that you get better nutrient cycling, you get a lot of different benefits associated, maybe reduction in how much how much nitrogen fertilizer you have to apply, or or maybe less crop protection chemicals because the cover crops compete with weeds. And so there's a whole bunch of associated agronomic benefits that come along with increasing soil carbon. And so that's kind of what we like to tell them is when you but when you stack all these 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 different revenues together, then it starts to become meaningful resources for your operation. And we try to front load the incentives that we give to the growers at the beginning of the contract so that if they have to buy some equipment 
you know, pay for some fertilizer, like in a rangeland situation, add some additional fencing if they want to rotationally graze, then they've got some resources to, to implement that, that practice with, that they wouldn't have had originally. Awesome. I like that. I like how you explained it kind of for our for our viewers and kind of what their specific benefits are. I think that's really, really nice way to bring that into the interview. And then I guess our next question is, what tools and technologies are you deploying in the company to measure, report, and verify soil carbon? Right. So we have a team of about 11 data scientists. There's agronomists, soil scientists, modeling people um, that we have a team of mo uh, that that implement this descent model, and so that's some of the technology we use. Remote like se Sentinel satellite imagery. We use the USDA provides us with really high resolution ground imagery. It's called NAPE imagery, and so we're using those that kind of information to kind of stratify our fields into different zones. You can kind of think of that as like management zones. Maybe your listeners would know that what that means. So almost all of these fields that we enroll are very highly variable. They have a lot of spatial variability in them. And what we have to do is stratify those fields down into different strata so that we can report the carbon that's accumulated in those different strata. And so we sample a minimum of like six soil sample points within a given strata to represent the carbon in there. So that way we're kind of accounting for that spatial variability. And when we do it that way, we're we're measuring carbon much more accurately. What we tell growers is in order for them to, or in order for us to be able to show a change in carbon over, over five, 10 years, we need to measure the carbon within a 10% margin of error. Think about margin of error. That's what, when uh, people talk about uh, polling outcomes, they always talk about the margin of error that poll is 10% or less. So that's, that's what we have found is that in order to measure carbon, accurately enough to, to show a response over time or an increase over time, then that's kind of what we have to do. And we're actually looking at some uh, some approaches for simplifying and cheapening the cost of measuring carbon. Right now, what we use is we, we collect a soil sample from the field. I think m many of your growers probably are familiar with that process in terms of soil fertility. So you collect the soil sample, you send it to a lab, and then you get the, the carbon analysis from that. But there are some folks working on what we are calling proximal sensing methods for measuring carbon. Um, probably some of your folks have heard of that, like Veris, EC tech, mm -hmm. environmental, or it's electrical conductivity measurements. Some of those sort of approaches have been shown to be correlated with measuring carbon as opposed to sending into the lab. And so we're evaluating that kind of technology to cheapen the cost of measuring that carbon so that whatever savings that we get by using those approaches, we can pass on to the grower then. That's awesome. I love how um, you can really see that your company's being very collaborative, um, especially on like the modeling and the data end, and then as well as like how you're making this more accessible to farmers and trying to find tools that can better fit what their needs are. I really like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's... Go ahead. No, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, that, I was just confirming what Katie had said there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I was uh, also confirming that that's great to see that you are using models and also like you mentioned about some technologies that you are trying to incorporate in order to uh, measure the soil carbon in an effective way. Uh, on that note, uh, like, what do you think, how accurate and reliable will be like or are the current state of art technologies such as the soil sensing device or soil sensing instrument that you talked and others are in terms of like measuring, reporting and verification of the soil carbon? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, th um, I think I, the answer to that question I would say is it's getting much better every day because there are a lot of people working in this space. I was at a conference in San Francisco last week, the World Agritech, Agritech uh, Summit and so, basically most of the focus of this session was around sustainable agricultural practices and, and the carbon credit markets were a center theme of that of that conference and it was just amazing how much uh, how many companies are investing in this how much uh, startup companies uh, we talked to several of those folks that are working in this proximal sensing and remote sensing using satellite imagery and, and we're going to work with whoever we think has the best solutions and I, th I would say you know every day we're getting more accurate in our ability to measure carbon. That's awesome to hear. We love to hear it. <laughs> um, my next question is kind of talking about 
how how specifically do your products at Agoro Carbon Alliance fit with other sustainable practices such as transitioning from strip from no-till and then managing nitrogen and kind of adding cover crops? Like, how do you fit into that? Right. So uh, a lot of times what's happened, like, for example, growers that do not adopt the, these practices, I think, the re- as we all know, the research has shown that cover crops, for example, can can uh, increase soil carbon, but there's a cost associated with that. And again, where we kind of try to come in is we help them offset some of those costs, not, not necessarily all, all those costs, but if they can get some incentives up front, then then that's where we might see some additional adoption of these practices. I think cover cropping right now across the U.S. is adopted on only on about only five percent of the acres in the U.S. and and it's that cost associated with the implementing that practice that has prevented growers from from doing that. Hey, that that sounds really interesting, and that's that leads us to another question here. Uh, that what do you think are the challenges ahead in advancing the carbon market, particularly maybe when we are talking about adoption of these practices, right? Farmers are hesitant to practice, and one of the things that you just highlighted is cost options. Are there like other challenges or any? Thing that comes to your mind regarding the challenges yeah i would say the number one challenge right now is is the what what carbon credits are commanding out there in the voluntary markets there's still just a lot of uncertainty a lot of uh, a lot of people have called this the wild west in terms of of what's going on in, in terms of these carbon markets and so it's like any kind of a new a new activity you have to build confidence and trust in the marketplace and that's one one role we're trying to play is we're trying to convince buyers by the, by the scientific methodology that we're using that these are actually legitimate carbon credits and so they have value and if you're a, a Microsoft or somebody like that that looking to offset your carbon carbon credits these are credits that are really gonna they're gonna have high value in the marketplace and they're going to be something that you can transparently claim is a legitimate carbon credit so uh, the USDA has gotten involved in this. They're they're spending they're putting a lot of resources into uh, into uh, the, what we call the measurement the the modeling and, and measuring of carbon in, in in soil. And so they're 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 all by the USDA participating in this. I think they add a lot of legitimacy to this activity. There were a lot of I don't know how much familiar your listeners were with the. Uh, with some of the grants that went out this past year around climate smart agriculture, uh, all of those sort of things, I think, are going to help get this launch, this carbon credit market, get it off the ground. I love that you bring it up, kind of calling it the Wild West. I feel like I, I, while carbon markets are not my specific source, um, place of study, but I have when I do hear about these things, it's a lot of the conversation is what is the legitimacy? Um, how do I know what I'm doing is accurate? How do I know that this is correct? And where do I see value in this? And how can I, um, how can I approach growers with having value in this? So those are all really excellent, excellent, phenomenal points to be making. Um, I really enjoy that your company is being collaborative and trying to be at the forefront of where the science is and finding these accessibility um, and solving some of these challenges that growers face with this very new topic and um, kind of prioritizing why they should care about this topic and why there is value in it. So I think that's really awesome that you bring out all of those points. I think they're super um, beneficial for especially for our listeners or for anybody who's um, kind of wondering about what digital ag looks like for the carbon market and what kind of companies, what are we doing out there and what what is the next step and how how can we solve some of these issues? So I really, really like that. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yes. So you did you did talk to us a little bit about um, how Agoro Carbon is working to adapt to these challenges for farmers and ranchers. Do you have any more you'd like to add on that subject? Yeah, I mean, I guess I, one thing I would like to say, too, is that the Yara is very serious about this. And so we're very fortunate to be working with a company that's is putting they put a big stake in the ground. They're they're actually in the process of, of working on green ammonia fertilizer production using wind power and things like that so uh, to me that says and that's one of the reasons I joined the, uh, this company is because Yara's commitment to to decarbonizing agriculture making it a, a more sustainable uh, practice going forward and so yeah I, I think I think the 
without having that kind of backing, there might be some concern. I mean, a buyer might say, well, is this company going to be around next year? Because there's been a lot of these companies that have shown up on the scene and then a year or two down the road, they're, they're gone. And so the, the fact that they're making these kind of commitments to, to, says to me, and that hopefully it says to the grower and to the buyer that they're, they're serious about making this work. That's awesome. An excellent point yeah. to bring up. Yeah, that's that's great to know that this company is very committed on helping towards sustainable farming practices. And uh, I think we just uh, talked a little bit about use of proximal and satellite sensors uh, in terms of the carbon market development. Uh, are there any other digital egg tools that you think will be important uh, in helping the development of the carbon market? Uh, relative to digital ag tools, uh, I think one maybe one thing to highlight and call out, and maybe for students like yourself that are thinking about careers in this space and digital ag, it's I think it's important to have a good science and technology background in, in engineering and soil science and and in some of the model modeling approaches. And the other thing is we're we've collected already I don't know in the thousands of soil samples. And just an incredible amount of information that we have there. We're you we're starting to use some machine learning and advanced data sciences approaches to, to kind of getting some learnings from this. In other words, if we have soil sample, we've got 20, we've got growers signed up in 20 states now, about 300, you know, quite a few growers. Uh, we've collected a lot of soil samples, and there's just an immense amount of knowledge associated with those because we'll have not only do we have this. The uh, where the soil samples came from and how much carbon's in that soil, but we've got we've got uh, climate data to go with it. We got the practices that these growers have implemented, and so there's just going to be an immense amount of learnings, and it's going to take some really smart data scientist type people to figure out and, and uncover those learnings, if you will. But it's just an incredible source of information that we've got. We're starting to collect now. So I love that. I love the. Um the vast knowledge and learning approach that your company is taking. I like, um, you can tell how you're collecting all of this data to do an act, like a very accurate and um, solid science job of characterizing what you're seeing. And I think that's really important and really valuable to highlight, especially in terms of carbon market and how that's being related in within the data to other sustainable projects. Um, sustainable measures such as climate and some of those things so I like you can really see how your company is this um, bigger picture and it's tying in a lot of these different factors and really on some of the cutting edge of the data sciences as mm. well so it's really awesome for you to point out I love that and then I'm going to transition us a little bit into our next question which is what are you most looking forward to in the future for the carbon market well, I, I guess what I'm most looking forward to is I, I, I hopefully the, the prices of carbon credits will increase over time as there becomes more confidence in these credits, because I think uh, the growers, uh, the, the revenue that they can be that can be uh, received from these practices is all a lot of it's dependent upon the carbon value. And so I think our company hopes that uh, that all these all these companies that have made some very significant commitments to greenhouse gas reduction start to see carbon credits as a way that they can reduce their 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 footprint, you know, like the Microsofts of the world, the Googles of the world, and whatnot that need that need to offset their their carbon footprint. Excellent point. Yeah, I think that that'll be really interesting to see for what how these companies that has placed for these uh, carbon or zero carbon practices would, would eventually lead to or eventually come out to the market and just take these carbon credits. Uh, and then as we are talking here about uh, just one thing I want to make uh, ask that. So Agro Carbon Alliance is mostly dealing with uh, crop producers. And is it like something that uh, ranchers can also take advantage of? Or like, can you just talk about what uh, aspects of farming communities mm -hmm. can benefit from these company services? Yeah, great question, Deepak, and appreciate that question. Actually, actually, a lot of our growers that we've signed up to to date are actually ranchers. Okay. And yeah, uh, they they've received again these incentives. Uh, we we've actually been 
had done some interviews with with uh, some of our marketing folks have been out on these ranches and where we where we've been able to get them resources, for example, to, to move water around their pastures so they can move the cattle around. The, the resources have been used to to buy additional fences so that they can that they can sequester those cattle in smaller paddocks. The whole the whole concept of rotational grazing is that you take a big pasture that's maybe five thousand acres and you divide it up into smaller paddocks, if you will, and you move the cattle around kind of in a rotational sequence. And so what the whole idea there is that you give that area of the of the farm or the ranch a little bit of time to rest. And when you, by doing that, by implementing those sort of practices, you actually increase the amount of forage that that, that farm ranch can produce because you're giving it that rest period and you're, and you're sequestering additional carbon in the soil. So they, they not only get some of the benefits associated with the carbon that gets stored in the soil, but they're getting an increased amount of productivity. A lot of the ranchers that we talk to say that they can increase their herd size 10% because of the increase in forage production that they get from these practices. So uh, yeah, uh, ranchers have, have been actually been one of the more successful uh, enrollees in our program. We, we have some row crop producers, but, but, but the ranching community has really reached out to us so, in a very significant way. That's, that's awesome to hear. I love um, that you brought up one who your who the communities that agrocarbon is reaching and then also some of the benefits that they're seeing when they use their when they use your company and that's really cool thanks for sharing that with us and then it'll lead perfectly into our next question and that is if our listeners wanted to learn more about the work that you were doing where can they find that information right so if you go to agoral carbon alliance just google that uh our webpage there and we we try to provide a lot of information like there's a calculator there that if a grower is interested we're using a, kind of an estimator so if they say they want to implement rotational grazing or reduce or no-till or cover cropping it, we're using basically what's the comet farm tool it's an estimator of how much carbon you can sequester so they can get kind of an idea of what kind of revenue they could receive from those fields we got we have what we call the knowledge hub there too so a lot of us uh, agronomist types have written some articles there that kind of provide some a little bit of a de you know definition and explanation of our program, how these practices work on your farm and ranch, and and the benefits that you can see from it. There's some there's some podcasts on there. As a matter of fact, I've done perfect. That. Yeah, perfect. I've done a couple Thank of you. those. Yeah, that's awesome. We love to hear yeah. it. Yeah, I'm really impressed with the with the uh, the the team of folks that we have on our in our company. Uh, they're all very bright young folks that uh, that have brought a lot of expertise to the company. And so we have a team, what's called a grower success team. Besides like science team, our, our team basically is responsible for developing the methodologies to measure the carbon. But then we have a team of folks that work with growers. You know, they're out there talking to them. They, they kind of help them along that in that journey of how they implement these practices so that they're successful. Because when they're successful, then we're going to be successful and everybody's successful, I guess. So we've got, a, those people are located all around the United States. So like in the, you know, where we got ranching acres, like there's, there's folks located in those areas. And again, they travel out there, they, they visit with the, the rancher, they talk to the, the farmer and, and help them kind of all adopt these practices along the way of the journey. I love that. It's uh, both ends of the string helping each other. I like that aspect. That's awesome. Yeah. I find that really interesting. Working one team working on science aspect and one aspect one team working yeah. on just with farmers. I think that's really helpful for farmers as well. And then in return to the company, we we also have a group that's selling these carbon credits, and so they explain our what we're doing to the Microsofts of the world, companies that be interested in buying the credits. And and the point there is they're we're, they're trying to communicate to these folks that what Agoro is doing in terms of providing legitimate carbon assets can help us get the most value for that carbon revenue. Okay, hey, that's that's great to know. And uh, is there anything uh, we didn't talk about today and you would like to share with our listeners? So what what I know what a lot of our people that talk with growers every day talk to them and tell them make sure that you do your homework because there are some people, you know, there are some programs out there that maybe don't give you all the details. And, and we also tell folks that these, these programs are not for everybody. And so 
rather than lead somebody on and think that this is a, is a panacea that's going to solve all their problems, we would say, no, that's not the case. This this revenue can help you offset some of your costs. But again, what we, what we really emphasize is the practices in and of themselves provide benefits to the grower, agronomic benefits that uh, when, when coupled with the, the carbon revenue starts to make a difference. That's awesome. I love that you point that out, that you, um, how you work within the communities that you're working with, um, how your company fits them and maybe not fits everybody. And I think that's such an important thing to encompass, especially when we're talking about yeah. um, such a, such kind of a new topic for people and it can be, and new can kind of be scary. So I like how your company's approaching it. It looks like you're covering a lot of bases between the science and what's yeah. similar to the extension work that universities do, things like that. So I think that's really awesome. Yeah. We, I mean, we re really lean a lot on the, on the research that comes out of land grant universities and USDA. I mean, basically the science behind what we're doing is, is all been done by folks like UNL and, and other universities around the country and the world for that matter. We, we're actually working in, we, uh, we're building a program in Brazil as well. So that's awesome. That is awesome. We love to hear it. I've been at the university doing the research. We love to hear that it's making a difference. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, we have one last question for you, John, and it's a tradition on the Farm Bits podcast is to ask for a piece of advice. So what advice would you give to anybody interested in learning more about the carbon market or utilizing this on their operation? Yeah, I, I would. I guess I would first uh, direct you towards our, our webpage, the Agro Carbon Alliance, and then and if they really want to get to know, there's like some of these registries, carbon registries, like the they can Google Vera, and and there you'll be able to see like we actually have a a document that there. It's our what we call our project development document. So if you really want to know what what we're up to, it's like a, a hundred page document. So you'd have to spend some time if you can't sleep some night, well maybe read through that document. But every every company that's out there, that's that's in this space. Is, is probably registered with one of these, what we call carbon registries. Vera is one. There's a there was one called the Climate Action Reserve. It's it's out of California. Uh, all of these all of these programs provide some transparency to the the grower, to the buyer, and and for folks that are like yourself that might be interested in a career in this in this field. It, I would encourage anybody that's you know, like you if you folks are thinking about this as a career opportunity way. Like, Get as much information and knowledge about about this as you can and so that you can make an informed decision. That's awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that with our listeners. Thank you very much to John for taking the time to join this episode of the Farm Bits podcast. It's really exciting to learn how Agoro Carbon Alliance is working hands-on with growers for science-based solutions. One of my favorite parts of this episode and what this company is doing is utilizing remote sensing sciences is utilizing remote sensing science to generate accessible solutions for farmers and ranchers globally. I would have to agree. My favorite part of the episode was learning about the multidimensional approach of the company working with farmers and other big companies to provide benefits to the farming communities. I hope you enjoyed this episode and we look forward to sharing another digital egg story with you next week on Farm Bits. Thank you for taking the time to join us today on the Farm Beats podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcast, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts to be informed about the latest content each week. We welcome your feedback. So if you have any comments or questions for us, please reach out to us over email, on Twitter, or in the review section of your favorite podcast platform. Our contact information can be found in the show notes. We would like to thank Nebraska Extension for their support of this podcast and their commitment to providing high quality informational material to members of the agricultural community in Nebraska and beyond. The opinions expressed by the host and guest on this podcast are solely their own and do not reflect the views of Nebraska Extension or the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. We look forward to you joining us next week for another episode of Farm Beats.